During America's first human spaceflight program, Project Mercury, the eyes of the world often focused on the launch pads at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Five, four, Lift off and the clock is turning. This is Philip Holland. The fuel is go. Oxygen is go. Another centerpiece facility for astronaut training, crew quarters, and spacecraft processing was Hangar S at the Cape. While not as well known as the Mercury Control Center and the launch pads, Hangar S was the location of crucial work supporting NASA's early human spaceflights. After the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was formed in 1958, the new agency announced the selection of seven military test pilots who would become America's first astronauts. Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Wally Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slayton would soon become household names. From 1959 to 1963, the 61,300 square foot Hangar S became a hub of activity as America prepared for the program to send men on their first trips into space. Hangar S was built in 1957. It housed operations of the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory's Project Vanguard. The 75-foot-tall rocket was part of the nation's earliest efforts to launch Earth-orbiting satellites. In 1959, NASA acquired Hangar S through an agreement with the Department of Defense and modified it for use for pre-flight processing. This is where the Mercury space capsules were received and tested. By the end of 1960, NASA referred to Hangar S as the nerve center of Project Mercury and home of the Space Task Group's Pre-Flight Operations Division, which had grown to over 400 technicians and contractors who prepared the Mercury capsules for launch. The processing of the Mercury spacecraft began with its arrival at the Cape Canaveral skid strip aboard a transport aircraft. It then was transferred to Hangar S for a capsule shakedown. The hangar contained all the necessary facilities, storage, and work areas required to prepare the capsule, including a white room. The spotless capsule checkout area was located in the northeast corner of the high bay. Across from the White Room was an altitude chamber used for Mercury capsule environmental control system testing and verification in a space-like environment. The altitude chamber allowed engineers and technicians to ensure the capsule would not leak in space, and it also helped verify that the environmental control system, along with other equipment, all worked as designed. Hangar S was the location for final assembly and checkout of the spacecraft's escape tower. Placed on top of the capsule for launch, the tower was designed to pull the capsule clear of the launch vehicle in the event of a mishap on the launch pad or during ascent. It jettisoned from the rocket when a safe altitude had been reached. Once all assembly, checkouts, and testing were complete, the Mercury spacecraft was transported a short distance to Cape Canaveral's Launch Pad 5 to be mounted atop a Redstone rocket for suborbital missions, or to Launch Pad 14 for mating to an Atlas booster for the flights to Earth's orbit. While astronauts prepared for their eventual trips into space, a group of chimpanzees also were undergoing training to ensure humans could withstand the physical strain and g-forces during a rocket launch. The chimpanzees' training began at the Holloman Aerospace Medical Center in New Mexico, but their preparations were completed at Hangar S. The task of responding to lights by flipping a lever would demonstrate that the chimps could not only survive in space, but also perform tasks throughout the flight. The first chimpanzee to fly was named Ham. 
he launched on Mercury Redstone 2 on January 31, 1961. During the 16-minute flight, the chimp flew 157 miles high and 420 miles downrange. After his recovery, a happy and healthy ham proved the way was clear for an astronaut to follow about four months later. On May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American to fly in space during a 15-minute suborbital flight. So this was a very significant flight because the country needed this. The whole free world needed this flight at this time. Two months later, Gus Grissom flew a similar suborbital mission aboard the Mercury capsule he named Liberty Bell 7. Throughout Project Mercury, Hangar S served as not only a spacecraft preparation facility, but it also was the base of operation for the astronauts after they arrived at the Cape, especially in the days and weeks just prior to launch. The astronauts often spent 12-hour days or even longer at Hangar S rehearsing their missions in the procedures trainer, an exact mock-up of the Mercury capsule's interior. The simulations would help prepare astronauts and ground controllers for the real thing. Climbing into that spacecraft and sitting on the top of the rocket was something we had simulated time and time and time again. The hangar also was the location of the crew quarters located on the second floor. The astronauts slept, ate, suited up, and underwent medical examinations in the days and weeks before flight. But on occasion, astronauts described the crew quarters as simply austere and uncomfortable. A primary goal of Project Mercury was to determine how humans would respond to trips in the environment of space. So a regular part of preparations for launch were medical exams by the astronauts' medical team. Once the health checkup was complete on launch day, it was time for the complex process of donning the spacesuit that would protect the astronaut in the event of a capsule depressurization. The next step was the astronaut climbing into an apparatus with a seat similar to the Mercury spacecraft. Technicians then checked out the suit to ensure it would pressurize and work as designed. With the suit up complete, it was time to head to the launch pad in the glare of television lights, the astronaut departed Hangar S for the transfer van. The specially outfitted truck would make the trip to Launch Pad 5 or Pad 14, where the astronaut would prepare for the final countdown. Three days after John Glenn's historic mission on February 20th, 1962, President John F. Kennedy visited Cape Canaveral to see facilities such as Launch Pad 14, where Glenn lifted off. The presidential tour included Hangar S, where Mercury spacecraft were being prepared for future missions. And during a special ceremony outside the hangar, President Kennedy congratulated America's first person to orbit the Earth and those who supported his historic mission. Glenn's mission was followed by three more orbital flights by astronauts Carpenter, Shira, and Cooper, each with longer missions and increasingly sophisticated capsule maneuvers and experiments. Following completion of the Mercury missions, the spacecraft would be returned to Hangar S for post-flight inspections. Key parts would be removed for study, so lessons learned could be applied to future designs. After the 22-orbit mission of Gordon Cooper aboard Mercury Atlas 9 in 1963, America's first human spaceflight program came to an end. Beginning the next year, Project Gemini would be NASA's bridge from the Mercury missions, learning how to meet President John F. Kennedy's goal to send astronauts to the moon. The first Gemini spacecraft also were processed for flight in Hangar S. The new program would allow humans to emerge from their spacecraft and begin to walk in space 
as well as rendezvous and dock with other orbiting spacecraft. But as NASA began opening new facilities at the Kennedy Space Center on adjacent Merritt Island, Gemini Processing moved to the Manned Spacecraft Operations Building, now known as the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. The interior of the Hangar S High Bay was modified later in 1965 with the construction of a satellite processing area. These spacecraft included the Franco-German Symphony communication satellite and the agency's Lunar Orbiter spacecraft that mapped the moon prior to the Apollo missions, taking humans to work on the lunar surface during the late 1960s and early 1970s. Five, four, we've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. We have the Apollo America's first space shuttle and the shuttle has cleared the tower. As the space shuttle era began in 1981, work at Hangar S supported the new effort. During the shuttle program, many types of equipment, such as scape suits, were maintained and repaired at the life support facility inside Hangar S. The rubber-coated self-contained atmospheric protective ensembles were worn by technicians at Kennedy and Cape Canaveral for protection during processing activities that involved hazardous chemicals such as rocket propellants or in the event of a spill. Much of the operational area was used to maintain equipment associated with the retrieval of the shuttle's solid rocket boosters. Two, one, zero, and liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle America will continue the dream. Following STS-135, the final space shuttle mission in July of 2011, work inside Hangar S came to an end. Cape Canaveral's Hangar S was America's starting point for human space exploration. NASA at the Kennedy Space Center now has transitioned from a historically government-only launch facility to a multi-user spaceport for both federal and commercial customers. NASA's team on Florida's Space Coast continues to work to meet the nation's spacefaring needs for the 21st century. These advances will include the Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System Super Rocket to take humans to distant destinations such as Mars and beyond. <laughs>